We'll begin by reading a few scriptures and then we'll go right into it. Our first scripture is from Luke chapter number 18, verse 18 to 30. We'll be reading from the NLT version. We can have that up. Say yes, forsaking all others. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I've carefully obeyed all these commandments since I was young, a young man. When Jesus had his answer, he said, there is still one thing that you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when they, the man had this, he became sad for he was very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, then who in the world can, get saved, can be saved? He replied, what is impossible for people, it is possible with God. Peter said, we have left our homes to come follow you. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brother or parent or children for the sake of the kingdom will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. Praise the Lord. Great scripture, right? Yeah, we can read the second one and then um, we'll keep continuing. Luke 10, Luke 10, 41 and to 42 NLT still. But the Lord said to her, Dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. But there is only one thing worthy to be concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Um, say yes, forsaking all others. And this is where I want us to begin. We can do everything with our lives, yeah? We can do everything, accomplish many things, you know? But if we do not have the one thing that matters, it will all be vanity of vanities. Our yes has to first be to God and then to whatever else, purpose included, a wife included, a husband included, that the first yes I got to give in my life ought to be to my savior, then to whatever else. All right, and um, I want to read for us a quote by Dr. Sherry Lewis. Some of us might know her. She's the ministry director of Bethel Atlanta, Kenya. This is what she says in her book, The God Zone. So many people worry about finding the will of God. They sit paralyzed for years waiting to discover God's plan. Just discover him, fall in love with him and his presence and make his kingdom a reality on earth and I promise he'll get you where you're supposed to be. He wants you to live out your purpose more than you do. So just give him your heart and trust him to make the rest happen. That is the summary of today's teaching. Because, you know, many of us have grown. I'll, I'll share my, I'll be sharing a, a bit of my story today. But I, I don't know about you, but we have grown really asking questions. Who will I marry? Which job will I work in? Which ministry do I plug into? Where do I move into? You know, wh who will be my spiritual parent? We have many concerns. We have many questions. And especially the question of purpose to us young people. Every day we're like, am I called to be a preacher? Am I called uh, to, to be in the marketplace? Am I called? And Dr. Sherry says, find the heart of the king and he'll give you the kingdom. Find the heart of the king, and he'll give you the kingdom. Praise the Lord. Many of you might know, I did law. That is between 2015 to 2019. Like uh, many people, I have been very ambitious, you know. I have been an A student all my life. So 
anyone who has been around me knew that my life, I was going somewhere. So I did well in my primary school. I, I did well in my high school. And I actually wanted to be a lawyer because I felt that in my heart, that is where my personality fit most. And um, I, I, want, I, I love justice. I love governance. So I, I, I felt that, you know, a few years to come, I'll be one of the best lawyers in the country. I, I wanted to do human rights law and international law. I'll be representing Kenya in those high profile cases and just help restore you know, the, the legal systems of Kenya and Africa. So I had big dreams. So I get to campus. First year is amazing. I am a diligent student, you know, the one who sits, even here, I sit near pastor because I want, I want to get every point. That, is, that has been my life generally, you know. So in campus, I was that person who is asking all the questions and with polished English, in my high school, I was in Modale Girls. When I went to campus, I tried to polish it a, a bit. So I was, I was doing well. In class presentations, you should have seen me, you know, nowadays I wear a lot of blonde, but I, in black suits in law school, and when I go back home, everyone thinks, finally, the savior of the family, because I was the first girl to go to university. They're like, I finally, tutakuwa na wakili katika familia. You know, first year, second year. Second year, I started having a battle in my heart, because I plugged into the CU, uh, I started loving, I have always loved God since I got saved, but when I was in campus, God just plugged me into, into, his, into the ministry and I got consumed. And so every time I am in ministry spaces, I feel very alive. I feel like this is what I was born to do. Every time I go to high school for a weekend challenge, we are preaching to the young ones and, you know, sharing the word of God, laying on hands, seeing the power of God move. I'm like, this is why I was born. Then on Monday, I need to be in class for a human rights law class. The conflict began in second year and every time I'd go back to God, I've always loved talking to God about my life and I'll ask God, okay God, oh Najua, you know very well, you know we have worked so hard. We got an A in primary. We got an A in, in high school. Now we are almost seeing the glory and you want us to drop it and do what? Carry a big brown leather jacket, which I, not, not jacket, Bible and go to preach and be given an envelope with many 50 shillings inside. Sorry, pastor, we don't do that in Rasi. Praise the Lord. That is not done here. Those, those churches, those ones, you know, but here we write you checks. Praise the Lord. Yeah, but you get what I'm saying. It was a battle in my heart because... The society around us views ministry as a lesser career. So if you're a person who is ministering, my parents are like, you, you, you have decided to be poor. Umeamua kwa maskini. Praise the Lord. They're like, we have, we have educated you. I, have, I, I am born of a single parent. So she was working in Gikomba country bus selling viazi. That is what has educated me. And so the time I'm going to tell her, mom, I feel that God has called me to ministry. Yes, I am smart and all. I would have loved to be a street smart lawyer, but there is this desire in my heart to see the world transformed by the gospel. And that is what I want to give my life to do. My mother cried. She cast. She disowned me. She told me, you either do it my way or I'm dead to you as a parent. That is not a long time ago. I'm not 50 years telling you, wow, when I was younger. Hey, you see when I was younger, hey, when I was just starting off. That was 2019, 2020, 2021. I was at my mother's house on Wednesday. Still the same story. Two weeks ago, she wanted to commit suicide. I didn't tell pastor. Forsaking all others. Say yes. Forsaking all others. And many people look at me and they're like, who are you? You're either stupid, because it's simple. People, even here, people have told me, I you can just go to KSL, Kenya School of Law, get the license, practice for a few years, then retire into ministry. Or weekends. You can do ministry as a weekend gig. You get. Like, Represent people in court during the week, you know, make a decent living, and then on Sunday, come be an usher in church. Ushering is amazing. 
but everyone has been called for something. And I know what I've been called to. So that was in 2019. It got to a place, the family pressure, the friends pressure, my own pressure. Because I also, who does not want to be an advocate of the high court to be introduced? Pastor will have given a very nice introduction. The one speaking to us this morning is not a small woman. She is the, you know, she is an international lawyer, you know, working besides Ocampo. It will have been amazing, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it have been? It will have. So in my heart, there's still that. I'm like, hey, Lakini Agnes. Oh, yeah, thank you. You know, it's okay. It's okay. But I was telling you about 2019. So 2019, the pressure is so much. My friends we graduated with, who we are graduating with from campus are making applications to Ivy League law firms, others going to KSL. And for some moment, I bulged. I was like, you know what? The Bible even says, honor your parents. Bon as if you were. So me, I'm just going to honor my mom and my relatives and my friends and make the application. It was painful, but I made the application. But I knew in my heart, this is not the path that God is calling me to. There are people, there are people who are lawyers or career people, whatever, engineers, and they still do. They are still pastors in their churches. They are still amazing ministry people. There is room for that. But I knew I have been set apart exclusively for the gospel. But I still chose to choose convenience. What was more acceptable? What was more, what, what will make me have less pain? I made the application. Then on my graduation day, that was before the graduation. I was even wearing this dress for the graduation. It looked a little different. It had to be adjusted, but yeah, it was more or less this. And um, right in the middle of that, God reminded me, a few days he had been speaking to me about the mistake I'm making. And this is what God told me. Agnes, if you choose convenience right now over my word, you're creating an appetite in your life to circumnavigate my word. It won't be the last time you're going around my word. The next time you want to marry, and I, tell, I, I speak to you about who to marry, you take them home, your parents refuse, what will you do? Go around my word. The next time you are in an office, um, there's a corruption deal. You have learned to go around my word. What will you do? Still the same thing. And that was my turning point. I was like, you know what? I know it's going to be painful. It's going to pain many people, myself and others around me. But I choose to say yes, forsaking all others. The scriptures that we have read today, we will be going back to them. And Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, I love what uh, that was chapter 18, but my point is, what, what Jesus was saying is, if you're choosing to follow him, your love for him in comparison to your mother, your father, your, your daughter, your son, actually will look like it. I don't know if we can find that verse. It will look like it. You know, when we say that everyone who is, who is choosing to follow, everyone who is choosing to follow God, and I assure you that everyone who has given up a house, it should be a few verses before that, but it's okay. So today I want us to look at three things. Say yes, forsaking all others. The first thing is count the cost. The second thing is find Jesus worthy. And the third thing is follow him. We'll only look at those three things. Let's look at the first one. Count the cost. Forsaking all others. Luke 14, verse 25, 25 to 33. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone. Yes, this is it. You must hate everyone else by comparison. That is your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters. Yes, even your own life. Even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money and then everyone will, will laugh at you. 
they will say, there is the person who started that building and could not afford to finish it. Or what king will go to war against another king without first sitting down with the counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Yeah, let's, 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 let's finish it from there. Following Jesus, like any other meaningful venture, you've seen in the scriptures, we've talked about a person who is doing a construction, a, a king who is leading a battle army, and any other, even those who, of us who are in investment, any meaningful venture, before you start it, you have to count the cost. Pastor is just from telling us the cost of the, the, the renovation. Otherwise, we can begin and then somewhere we're like, oops, money is out and we don't have this, we don't have that. So it is important for all of us. And you know, we have been saying that um, God is going to do great things through us. You know, we want to be the move. And yes, we are because God has called us. But this morning, I want to tell us it will cost you something. And it, I'm not just speaking to people who have been called to ministry like myself. Whatever that God has called you to do, it will cost you something. It might cost you waking up earlier than your peers. It might cost you praying more. It might cost you practicing more if you're an instrumentalist or anything. But it will cost you something. And in fact, it will cost you your very life. Scripture has said, your very life. And this is what that looks like. The calling that God has called us to is as we have been saying, to die to self. That is how you, it, it's costing you your life. Where you're dead. Where you're dead. And not dying today and then resurrecting tomorrow. You die and stay dead. Dying to the pressure of the community around you. Dying to the systems of this world. Dying to the definitions of people of what success looks like. Dying to the definition of what the kind of wife you need to marry from people around you. We got to die and stay dead. I remember when, that's 2020, I remember when my, my, my colleagues were going to, were going to have, they have, we have graduated, then they are, they are going to Kenya School of Law where they do the one-year program to get the license and they are all in suits, they are sharing on, on, uh, on Facebook and you're seeing what, that could have been me. And that time, what am I doing? Uh, preaching to street kids. This week, a friend of mine came. Uh, we, we, we were friends from high school, you know, those people who you, you used to get A's together and compare notes. He was in a boys' school, so I was in a girls' school. So he, he did well. He's now, he did engineering, now he's a great engineer. So he came to visit. He was like, I, you're at Gara, I can pass by. So when he came, I was mopping. <laughs> he found me, can I can anywhere here? He found me mopping. I was finishing up to the Thursday just before service. So I'm barefoot. I'm there in Imeinama doing my thing. So I was like, oh, you're here. So we went to the office. So he sat and then he looked at me and I could see the concern in his face. So he's like, oh, have you been? How are you doing? What are you up to? I'm like, yeah, I'm working here nowadays. So what do you do here? Um, so I mop at times. <laughs> And so he, he, he decided to advise me. He's like, but Agnes, you are a very smart young woman. Couldn't you be practicing and then maybe get some ministry opportunities over the weekend? But, by, by, you know, it was too late. 2021, I mean, it was too late. Uh, so I, I don't know how I deflated his point, but the point is why for me I'm able to say it's too late because I have journeyed with the Lord and he has taught me to die. It's been every single moment I see a colleague who is where I thought I should have been and I go back to my knees and tell God, God, thank you because I'm right where you wanted me to be. Praise the Lord. Run your race. Say yes to your journey. Your 35, uh, all your siblings are married, you're still trusting the Lord, they think, Kwani, you're too selective, there are many men out here. Die to that pressure. Die to that pressure. And stay dead. If you need to 
go on your knees and speak in tongues for an hour, reminding yourself, this is what God has told me. He has a suitable helper for me. He has a great plan for my life and nothing can abort that. Speak that, the truth of God's word over your life. I journal a lot. And every time, every time I feel like I'm in a place where I'm forgetting what God has said over my life, I go back to my journal and I read it loud in my, in my studio apartment in Lakisama. Yes, I live in Lakisama. And I'm not ashamed of it because I'm in God's plan for my life. And I read, I say, God has called you to be a firebrand in this generation. God has called you to preach his word. I preach to myself. You should find me. And after that, ah, I come out here and I am fire. Praise the Lord. Because I know and I know God has called me. And I want you to have that conviction in your heart today. Whatever that God has called you to do, die to the pressure around you. Die to your own ambition. That's the other thing. God has spoken to you about what you need to do, but you think that you have a better plan than God. You're like, ay God, lakini. Imagine ile pesa ningekuwa nikipea kanisa, ningekuwa wakili. Hii project I could have told pastor, pastor, stop it. Salary yangu ya next month. I tell them just to wear it to Ratsi. That's personal ambition. Because I feel like that is the way I need to stand with God's work. But right now, what has God told me to stand with God's work? To mop. And that's what I'm doing faithfully. So whatever, wherever that you are at, faithfully. And wear that heart majestically. Praise the Lord. We are still together, right? The caveat to that is God doesn't want us to walk with measuring sticks, checking how we are doing on the sacrifice scales. This is what I mean. Where I feel like, I have sacrificed a lot. You guys, you're, you're very carnal. You know, me, you know what I left to be here? Do you, do you understand what I could have been? Where you, where you feel like maybe you have sacrificed too much and the other extreme is where you feel like I have not given enough. This is what God wants us to do this morning. Don't look at Agnes and what she has sacrificed against what God is calling you to forsake. The topic is, say yes, forsaking all others. God will ask us to forsake different things. It will look different for every person. So the question is, in my heart, what is it that God has been telling me to let go and I'm still holding on to? In my heart. It doesn't have to be a career like myself. It could be a boyfriend, a girlfriend. It could be the wrong employment. Yes, you're called to the marketplace, but you're with the wrong boss because you feel like that is where the money is. What is it that, the other thing is, what is it that you will say no to if God asked? Imagine if today, wherever you are, God told you it's time to move, to do something else. Would you? This is what I've been telling, some people have been asking me, Agnes, what if you're wrong? What if five years down the line you realize, oops, uh, this ministry thing was just for pastor. Uh, let me, I feel like God is, and you know what my answer is? My yes was to God, not to ministry. My yes is to God. So wherever he leads, I follow. If today God told me your time here is up, imagine I'll not even think twice. Why? Because my desire beyond doing great things for God, I just want to follow him. That's the second point. The second point is find Jesus worthy. Find Jesus worthy. Find Jesus worthy. Many of us, the reason why we are unable to forsake everything else and follow Jesus is because we don't feel like he is worthy of the things he's asking us to let go. Is Jesus worthy of you dropping everything, everything and going after him? We can read 1 Peter 2, 7. Unto you, therefore, who believe he is precious, but to them which uh, be in disobedience, the stone which the builders dis disallowed, the same is made the, the, the head of the corner. But the point is, to us who have believed, Christ is precious. We can also read Revelations 5.12, then I will explain them both. Revelations 5.12. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy, worthy is the lamb. 
there's a, there's a, there's a missionary uh, group, that they were called the Moravians, back I think in the 1800s. And how they, how they managed to advance for so long and do what they were doing, their, their motto was, you know, the lamb is worthy to receive the reward of his sacrifice. They sat and realized, why did actually Jesus die? Why did he come die on the cross to save the world? And so, because he paid the price, he deserves the reward of whatever he was working for. The same way that when a farmer goes to farm, they, they deserve to harvest, praise the Lord. So Jesus came and he died. So he, he, deserves, he deserves to receive the reward of his sacrifice. And if in our hearts we are able to find Jesus worthy, there will be nothing too big to forsake. You know, and, and, and you know many times people ask me, oh, you know, it's such a big sacrifice. Someone, I think it's Heidi Baker who says, it's not sacrifice, it's an act of love. It's not sacrifice, it's an act of love. That when Christ asks me to forsake something in pursuit of him and I forsake, I won't come and cry, oh, the way I have forsaken everything. No, I'll be delighted that, you know, we are the bride of Christ. Praise the Lord. Let's, let's, take, let's take this picture. We are the bride of Christ. He is our groom. And when, the, when for, yesterday we were in Ellie's wedding, when they were exchanging the vows and saying, forsaking all others, I choose you. For them, it was not a wow, I'm sacrificing a lot. Like Ellie will be saying, I'll be seeing beautiful women around and I'm like, wow, I'm just stuck with you. It's, it, that's not the case, right? Because he loves her and she loves him. So as they are saying, I'm choosing to forsake everyone else and just be with you. It is an act of love. It is not sacrifice. We are able to say yes to Christ and respond to his love. Why? Because he first loved us. He first loved us. So anything that he is asking you to let go today, it might be difficult, but remind yourself, this is love. This is what love looks like. Love looks like something. And if I say I love the Lord, and I'm, not, and I'm still clinging on to things that he's asking me to let go for me to follow him, then do I really love him? Praise the Lord. Are we there? The other example is uh, the story in Matthew 13, 44, where Jesus gives a parable of a, a person who went and found a treasure. And they're like, what? I found this treasure. Man, what did they do? They went back and sold everything to come and purchase this piece of land. They purchased the land just for the sake of that treasure. And the question is, is Christ worthy for you to go back and say, I am choosing to sell everything I have and just follow him. And I hope that by now you're already seeing in your life the things that you need to forsake and follow him. The things that have, have been competing for the, for, the, for the position of Christ in your heart. What is it that he is asking you to forsake today as you say yes to him? Praise the Lord. And when we see Jesus in light of who he is, the lamb worthy of, the sacri of his sacrifice and the king worthy of our worship, anything becomes dim in comparison. Missing a plate of food just to spend time with Jesus, it becomes something small. Those of us who struggle with fasting, how about we begin seeing it as I am, I am, I am forsaking food for that, that time I have with my groom, Jesus. When we find him worthy, when he tells you, I want to send you to East Pokot for six months, you'll be like, wow, he has just seen me to go to East Pokot. What an honor. And I will go running. Find him worthy. Find him worthy. Find Christ worthy of your life. Could we have a church where if God says stop, we stop. Because I feel like we're in a generation where we want to plan ourselves. And yes, we are born again, we pop the spirit, but I have a plan. Where are the people who would say, you know, I, when, 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 we're reading, when we're reading the stories of the God's generals and even the apostles in the, in the Bible, do you see the kind of lives that they are living? We are the move that God 
pastor has been saying this, that it is us that God is using to revive this nation. But how is he going to do it if we are still, you know, sat within our plans and our ambitions? Can we be flexible and malleable and tell the Lord, anytime you want to use someone for whatever thing, I will say yes. I will say yes. If today God came and told me, eh, I need you to join the army. I'm like, ah, lakini see God, you said I, I, I will preach the gospel. No, mine is to say I am here for whatever. I am here for what you want me to do. I am here for what you want me to do. Amen. When we find Christ worthy, we will be li- willing to follow him wherever he leads. That's the third point. We said count the cost. It might not be easy, but we've also said it is not sacrifice. It's an act of love. You're responding to the love of he who first loved you. And when you find him worthy, follow him wherever he leads. Wherever he leads. Wherever he leads. Underline that. Wherever he leads. Wherever he leads. Wherever he leads. It may look different in different seasons, but he is a good shepherd, able to lead you to good pastures. Imagine, good pastures. He knows where the good pastures are. You might think you know, your parents may think they know, but the good shepherd knows. Follow him wherever, wherever he is leading you. We can read uh, still in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. KJV, yeah, thank you. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 20, read verse 20 also. And they straight away left their net and followed him. He told them, follow me and I will make you. And they left straight away, not after 10 years. They're like, "Eh, God, I know this is what you've said, but let me first finish this shuguli that I have. God, I know this is what you've said, but uh, see, we can just do next month. We can do next year or after the elections, you know. He told them, follow me. I will make you. And what was their response? They left straight away. For the work that God is calling us unto, he needs urgency. There is urgency. There is urgency. I repeat, there is urgency. And we need to follow straight away. Even when it looks foolish, even when it looks inconvenient, even when it's going to turn your whole life around, what's our response supposed to be? Straight away, leave our nets and follow him. And it starts in the heart. You know, there's a way you can follow, but you're following Kimuli Muli. You know, the, the body is there, but the heart is still in law school. Praise the Lord. It's a heart issue, right? And then the actions will, will follow. Yeah. And the amazing thing is, when we're thinking about purpose, going back to the quote that we began with is, he told them, follow me and I will make you. I do not know, to be honest, I do not know how my life is unfolding. I am just following the shepherd one step at a time. His word being a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. My work is to do what? To follow. My work is to follow. Not to try to figure it out and say now in my strategic plan of 10 years, it's amazing to plan. It's awesome to plan. I am a planner. If you know me, you know I love things planned out. But beyond, beyond planning, there is a helper who is able to lead me one step at a time. And if he tells me now it's time to turn right, what do I do? Turn right. If he says, uh, now it's next, uh, I love, in my book. <laughs> this is where you clap. This is where, you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys. When I was writing, 
one of the things that God kept kept telling me is because I was writing in the midst of that because I was writing in 2019, so it's when everything is happening. It's when I'm writing, and He kept telling me two things that stood out. What God gives us is not a map. You know a map. You remember the sailors when they are going. You have the whole map, so you're able to see this is where Kinangop is. That is where Naivasha is. That is where so we'll be using this route. That's not how God works. He gives you a compass. You know how a compass works? It will tell you now we are moving north. You move north until it tells you, okay, now we are moving south. Because if we have the map, why then do we need God? If I'm able to look at my life and say, so now uh, I've turned 26, all right, amazing. I will get married next year. Somebody say amen. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? that I'm able to walk with the Savior one day at a time. And, 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 and that's the other thing that God does. Even with prophetic words, they build into one another. Like I had a prophetic word about writing the book. I wrote the book. Uh, now God is also still speaking about the book, the things I need to do with it, which he didn't say in the initial plan. Maybe I would have been proud or scared. You understand? So that as we are following the Lord, he, remember, he is a good shepherd leading you where to pleasant pastures. And he knows, imagine, before this life was yours, it was his. So he, he, he knows where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there, how you will get there, who you will find there, what they will do to help you keep moving. So can we follow him? Forsake all others and follow him. Remember the song we love singing a lot? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. And this is what Jesus will tell them. That no one puts their hand on the plow and looks back. What do they do? They plow forward. It's very easy. Remember the story of the disciples when after Jesus has been missing for some time and then Peter is like, well, let's just go back fishing because it has beaten each other. Yeah, <laughs> and so when Jesus comes, he's like, guys, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, you, they, they had forgotten that he had called them out of that space. But after things have become thick, Jesus has disappeared. They're like, hey, uh, I still have my law practicing license. In case this ministry thing does not work, we can always, we have a fallback plan. Mm -mm. If we're choosing to say yes to him, just like Brenda and Ellie were saying one to another, forsaking all others. Every other plan I thought I have now is not a plan at all. You are the only plan. And remember, he is a good shepherd, able to lead you where? To pleasant pastures. Praise the Lord. The other thing I was thinking about is the story of Moses, right? And I was asking myself, yes, probably right now I may be excited because God has said amazing things about my life. I will become this, I will do this, I'll do this. But what about if I don't get to do all that? What if like Moses, God called me and told me, Yo, you're delivering my children from captivity and taking them into the promised land, but I don't get to the promised land. What if God has said you will be a great evangelist, great minister of the gospel, like I have, and then all my days I just be sweeping and mopping? Will it be enough for me to have walked with God even if all these things don't happen? Will it be enough for me to know that I have walked with the Savior even if I don't become a great woman of God, even if I don't marry well, I'll marry next year. We have said amen. But even if I don't, you get what I'm saying? So that as we are saying yes to God, we have level heads above our shoulders. That I'm not saying yes to God because of what he has said I'll become. I'm not saying yes to God because he'll make me wealthy because that I just want him. Even if I don't ever have any other thing, it is enough to have him. Even if I live, like, I, I remember uh, there's a, an example pastor was saying sometime back when he was saying when he was in, uh, in the island in Uganda. And he was saying that 
Even if he spent all his life there, like it will just be amazing that he has Jesus. Can we get ourselves to that point? Because you see, one of the things that, that, that kills our drive for the Lord is disappointments. Hey God, you said I'll get married this year. We are in March, no one has approached me yet. God, you said before I'm 30, I'll be having a multi-billion company. I'm still employed. I'm 29 and a half. So 30 comes and passes and you're like, ah. Are we able to say yes to him and follow him regardless? You see what, I want you to have the, the picture of the bride because we are the bride of Christ, the bride and the groom. Uh, even if we eat omena every day in the house, you're still my husband. But we know our God is faithful, Right? We know that he is good. He is able. Ah, the other story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They tell the king when they have not bowed and um, they, 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 the king calls them and they want to be put the, to the furnace of fire. And they look at the king and they tell him, you know what, king? We know that our God is able and we know he will. But even if he does not, we still won't bow. I know that God has said great things about my life. I know that he is taking me places. He's using me, he's using me mightily. He's fulfilling his promises over my life. But even if he does not, even if it does not happen, I'm still choosing him over everything else. I'm still saying yes to him as my groom. Not because of his bank account, but because I love him as my savior. I'm responding to his love that he first loved me with. The things, that I, the things that God wants to do through our lives, they are great and wonderful. And the starting point is being able to forsake everything for him. And as we follow him, he will make us and he will lead us to where we are supposed to be. Praise the Lord. You may not have all the answers to your life questions. We never do. Trust me. Even when you'll be 50, you still have questions. When you'll be 70, you'll still have questions. I thought by the time I'm 26, I'll have figured out my life well. I'm 26 right now. You may never have all the answers. But let it be enough to know that you have him who knows everything. And his spirit that lives inside of you because you're his child, it's able to reveal that truth to you. As we keep following him, he's able to tell you where you're supposed to be. He's able to cause you to do what you're meant to be. Praise the Lord. I want to call the worship team. And God is saying to someone here, Martha, Martha, you're concerned about many things. But only one thing is needful. Only one thing is needful. Only one thing is needful. Only one. Imagine it's just that one thing. And every other piece will fall in place. Are you able to say yes to him, forsaking all others? I want us to stand on our feet. Count the cost. Find Jesus worthy of that price to pay and follow him. Yesterday I was, I was, I was sharing on Facebook, a Facebook live, and I was asking people. My life has been amazing. It's, 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 it's blessing many people. You know, the book I wrote, it's blessing many people. I said yes. But that is just one yes. Ah, I remember in the forward of that book, Reverend Danu writes and she says, my peace, it, it's, it's a puzzle, right? The, uh, God's plan for mankind is a puzzle, a whole puzzle. My peace, Motedia's peace is just one piece in the puzzle. But for the puzzle to be complete, your peace is needed. Your peace is needed. The puzzle can't be complete with pastor's peace only or my peace only. Yours is needed for whatever unique thing that God has called you to do. And that is what God wants you to say yes to him. Remember your yes is first to God and then to following him wherever he's leading you. Whatever thing he's calling you to do. So this morning I just want you to look into your heart. What is it that 
you've been saying no to, that God has been telling you to say yes to him about and you've constantly been saying no, fighting to him, trying to choose what is convenient. The people here who God have called for ministry, but you've felt, I, I don't want to be poor. What, how, what will people say about me? There's an anointing today. There's an anointing today. That will make your yes easier than mine. And I want to release that grace over you this morning.